Hello and welcome to Forum. In February, EU leaders decided to reduce the EU budget for the period from 2014 to 2020 to 960 billion euros. It meant slashing spending on a number of key projects. The problem is EU leaders can't decide alone. They need members of the European Parliament to agree on it. A first answer has been given by MEPs in Strasbourg this month. The conclusions of the heads of state and governments represent no more than a political agreement, they said. The so-called multi-annual framework was rejected. But does this mean more money for the EU? Not really. The devil is in the detail. But before we start, let me present you my guests. They are. On my left, I have Danish MEP Anna Jensen of the group of the Liberals. Welcome. On my right, I have Richard Ashford, British member of the European Parliament, of the European Conservatives and the Reformist Group. On my left again, Ivalu Kalfin, hello, your Bulgarian MEP of the Socialists and Democrats. And last but not least, of course, Marianne Marinescu of the group of the European People's Party. Hello to everybody. My first question will be to you, Ivalu Kalfin, your rapporteur on, on this issue. Um, the text adopted today, let's say, does this mean more money or just some negotiation starting? As I said, the devil is in the detail. The message that the Parliament uh, sent today, with a very large majority of the votes, is that uh, this agreement cannot be accepted without further negotiations. So we are open to start the negotiations. Uh, we uh, more or less uh, indicated what is the scope of the negotiations and what are the issues that we would like to see on the table. And the Parliament would be ready to start immediately with that. But uh, in the state they are, the, the, the conclusions of the Council could not be acceptable. By the way, uh, this was not a vote on the conclusions of the Council. This was yeah. a vote on providing a mandate to negotiate. So mm -hmm. uh, we are going to see what's the result of the negotiations and afterwards decide on on the whole package of the conclusion. So it's the first step. My question was 960, 959, be a bit more precise. Um, yes or no? We didn't particularly mention the ceilings, but we don't exclude them from the, uh, from, the, from the negotiations. Of course, with these ceilings, the big concern of the Parliament, and this is also in the resolution, is that uh, the ceilings of the budget uh, do not match at all the political ambitions of the, of the European Council. Practically, we set the payment level ceilings uh, to the level of 1989-1990. And we are talking about two, uh, 2020. Uh, 20 years ago, the European uh, Union was with, without half of its members, with much less ambitions, etc., etc. So you cannot fix the same budget and uh, look at the future. So this discrepancy between uh, levels and ambitions has to be closed. So either we increase the levels or we decrease a little bit uh, the declarations that the European Union is going to fix plenty of problems. It seems this is approximately the, the budget of 2005. Richard Ashwood, David Cameron was a leading force in February during the Council to say we have to cut something here. Uh, today, the Parliament, the House you're in, said no. Did you agree on it? Oh, I think I know the answer, of course, but uh, just tell well, us. We have to remember that uh, you described earlier, this is a budget to run for seven years for the European Union. So once every seven years, uh, the Parliament has the opportunity to have a very intense debate with the Council. And this is the only real opportunity you have once every seven years. And I think what we're seeing going on is Parliament adopting uh, a negotiating uh, position. Uh, the, that negotiation, negotiating position is not so much, in my opinion, about the numbers, but it's about the technical details which go with the, with the, with, with the agreement. Uh, and there I expect there will be some pretty intense negotiations, but I'd be very disappointed if four months from now we didn't have uh, an agreement. Because it means in June you will have to decide something yep. and there, there, will, then there will really be a vote on yes or no, we take it, we leave it. The sooner the better, it okay. depends very much okay. on the willingness of the mm -hmm. Council. Anna Jensen, room for something, what should change, what has to be changed? We said it before, the devil is in the detail, yeah. where should something be changed? Well certainly we are calling for flexibility. We have seen in, in this period, uh, this seven year period, that uh, four or five times we've had to take money from the agricultural area and use it for Galileo, for foreign aid, uh, for energy policy. 
new things that came up and from now on until 2020 new things might happen and actually with the budget that the heads of states have agreed there is no possibility whatever to create new things and I don't think it's reasonable that we as a parliament accept to tie down the next parliament and say they could not find out any new measures that could solve new problems that might arrive from now on until 2020. That's why we need flexibility, the possibility to change priorities. Does it, does it mean you're not able to pay the bill? Well, uh, that's a different question. I mean, I mean you, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, that's a different question. The question whether you have enough uh, money. Um, I'm more talking about the possibility of prioritizing but we've had a system where uh, paying the bills have become a problem because uh, many of the projects we are making are over many years it's uh, new member states getting money for investments in infrastructure and when you build a motorway or a railway you don't pay the bills at the same time they come running in gradually and there we've seen at the end of the period all of a sudden a lot of member states say hey come on these bills are increasing we haven't got the money but the fact of the matter is that they should know the money would arrive because they have promised to pay so the uh, the uh, European Union must be able to fulfill her obligation and that is certainly a demand for Parliament we cannot put the Commission in a situation where it's acting against the financial regulation Against the financial regulation, Ms. Marinesco, I'll go round. Uh, why did your group today say, okay, we are ready to reject what was proposed until now? What, what was the point where you said, we reject it? It, it was indeed a question, do we put the word reject or not in our text? As you know, we have also a member of our group as rapporteur, Mr. Uh, Mr. Berge. Yeah. So uh, there were a lot of discussions in the last uh, period. Uh, uh, we didn't accept the word "reject" in the in the uh, resolution, and we propose the members to to take it out. Unfortunately, this amendment didn't go through. So at uh, the end, at the final vote, the delegations were split. Some of the delegations voted against the resolution, some of the delegations um, uh, voted for the resolution. I think more uh, for, uh, in favor of the resolution. So I think that um, the resolution is uh, presenting the position of the parliament. What the parliament wants to negotiate and to, to, uh, to uh, take from, uh, to, from the, the council to to have uh, uh, the accept, uh, to have something more than the uh, conclusions of the European Council um, uh, concluded. But why to say reject? For the moment, we do not have the, the proposal, the legislative proposal from the General Council. Yeah, we have the conclusions of the of the European Council, but we do not have the legislative proposal. On the other side, you said already, we do not ask for more money. Yeah. Will you ask maybe later? We we'll do come not back ask for more it, money, but, uh, so why to say reject? Anyway, in the same paragraph, in the same article, it was written that we should um, uh, approve this if we shall have these um, uh, very important um, uh, conditions uh, f uh, fulfilled. So, in, in my opinion, uh, only the I don't know the psychological uh, uh, reason that we uh, have to to show a strong. Uh, uh, signal to the to the council it's uh, not a, uh, a good uh, point so we want the points very good points flexibility revision of the of the uh, amending budget at, at the middle and all the others an amending budget for 2013 which is very very important for us because the commission doesn't have the money to pay the bills right now so there are very important um, uh, points. I think it will improve a lot the, the MFF 2014-2020. But I think that the negotiations um, uh, negotiation means to uh, uh, sp uh, to to debate uh, about. So after that, we shall decide as as you said in uh, in June. Mr. Ashford, will you yeah. debate the same way? Well, look, the point <laughs> I wanted to make there, everybody seems to be agreed on flexibility. Uh, and the fact is, 
wh wherever we finish up in terms of numbers, it's going to be less than it was before. But the aspiration of what we want to do with that budget is greater. So we are currently constrained by the methodology, by the way that we run the budget, that money has to be put in pots designated for agriculture, designated for structural funds. Now, that's crazy. It's an inefficient way of using money. And subject to all the proper constraints and controls, you should be able to move that money, not just between headings, but actually between years, because these are long-term investments which governments are making through contractors. They're entering to long-term commitments, and they need the stability to know that the money will be there. If we don't get that flexibility, we can't offer that stability. But we need to know the, the money for each program because there are long-term projects that uh, uh, the member states will, will uh, implement, so they need to know how much money uh, they, can, uh, they can have. I, I want to, to add something. If we want to fight with the Council, we can fight as Parliament if we negotiate in the co-decision uh, procedure all the horizontal um, uh, legislation uh, proposals, yeah, because we have there agricultural, um, transport, um, cohesion policy. There we have the power, equal power with the council. So we can we we can negotiate and we can maybe uh, have even more money. And the answer, the word fight is the. <laughs> yeah, but it's as if uh, it's only in the legislative file we we have uh, equal power. It's true. It's it's only consent but cleverly used you can achieve a lot with consent uh, and uh, we have shown that before so we're going to do that and of course we need to have a process where we relate to the people doing the legislation because what the heads of state did in the February meeting was to sit there each one of them and say what's in it for me and ask for money for themselves. None of them ask what's in it for us. I mean, France wanted more money for agriculture. Why? Because France get money in a big pot for agriculture, not by saying this is good for European agriculture. And that's <coughs> where I think we want a better process in the future from the side of Parliament. And we're going to show them that this hackling about the money, this Turkish bazaar, which they claim is the only option, the only way you can do it. It's actually the only way you cannot do it. You should do it in a proper manner, deciding what things are we supposed to do in the future, and then finding the money for it. And so to continue but, on this yeah. idea, the Council introduced yeah, also in the conclusions a lot of elements that now, following the treaty, are under the co-decision uh, procedure, so they should not do such a thing. They do not have the right to do it, the European Council. Mr. Manners, there's one gentleman who wants to show this uh, to the leaders of the EU. This is Martin Schulz, President of the European Parliament. We followed him just after the vote. He gave us a short briefing afterwards. Just let's listen to him and to these key words. This is a very important day and an important step for the European democracy. After the heads of states and government uh, concluded not to accept the most important uh, points of the European Parliament in their compromise, it was, force, it was foreseeable that the European Parliament would refuse the draft proposal. We want to discuss about uh, more flexibility within uh, this uh, multiannual budget, flexibility between the categories and between the years, and a revision clause. One of the main uh, requests of the European Parliament to negotiate with the Council is the so-called own resources. Many keywords we have to explain. Mr. Coffin, when I hear own resources, revision clause, what does it really mean? Well, what will you be able to do? if you would have to do a continue your report, in fact. Let's take uh, the own resources, although Anne is the specialist in the rapporteur on the own resources, if you allow me uh, to elaborate a little bit. Uh, now the European budget depends on the contributions from the national budgets, and this is a burden for the national budgets. What we want to do, this is not to make a bigger European budget. We want to make it more autonomous, less dependent on the national budgets, but also less of a burden for the national budgets to contribute to it. 
to a certain extent. The Commission had some proposals. There might be some other proposals, whatever there, there is, but this is also embedded in the Lisbon Treaty. Since the creation of the European Union, it was supposed to live on the own resources, not on contributions every year from the, from the national budgets that are under really very serious constraints. And we can understand the finance ministers that are very reluctant to pay the promises of their prime ministers at European level. So in order to avoid that, we need at least a commitment, a roadmap, how the member states are going to sit together and to decide in the coming years about shifting not now 80% dependence on the, uh, on the contributions from the national budgets, but uh, to decrease that. In the Commission's proposal, it was to decrease it to 60%. Uh, but I think that uh, we could be more ambitious in that, than that. Richard, will the UK ever be, will, will the UK agree sometimes to say, OK, own resources, let's go? Well, look, uh, we're open to options. Mm -hmm. We're open to, uh, to, to, to uh, ideas on this. But firstly, be clear that that 80% uh, which is r derived from 1% levy on the gross national income of each nation is an own resource. You talk about it is not an own resource. It is technically an own resource. We have a vision of a European Union which is largely supported by that one payment from the 27 people who own it. Now, I put it to you. I'm employing you. I pay you. Uh, I pay you once a year, 1% GNI. What happens if you then turn around and say, no, 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 I earn my own income now, so I don't need any money from you. What does the relationship look like and what's the dynamics between the European Union and the member states? Suddenly, the European Union has become a country on its own. Well, this is something the European no, Parliament no, would maybe agree not, on it, Mr. Marinescu. No, 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 this is not like this, <laughs> not at all, because the money is coming uh, also from the member states, but based on, I don't know, financial uh, tax or uh, other uh, uh, financial transaction tax or other uh, tax from VAT and so on. So it will be a relationship between the Union, of course, and, uh, and the member states. But as uh, was said, it will be very good if the budget will be let's say half independent. It will not be based on the contribution of the member states. Because we are in the time of crisis, but uh, um, uh, in normal, uh, in normal uh, time, we can, uh, we can have a, a, a very good budget, good for the projects that we want to uh, implement, based on on uh, own uh, resources. Annie Jensen. I think the big problem is this, what, what we call the just retour thing, thinking. Uh, Margaret Thatcher said, I want my money back. But all heads of states are thinking exactly that. I want my money back. And uh, what we've tried in Parliament was to have a discussion on European added value and what is best financed by national budgets and what is best financed by the European Union budget. I feel that the, the council hasn't sufficiently taken that discussion. Yes, we need to do that because it should make sense what you put on the European Union budget and we shouldn't have this discussion where it's all the time thinking about what do I get back but how does this European Union budget create extra value. That's what we like to uh, make for the future. Well, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you just look at the Italian elections, I'm sorry to come back to this, yeah. the added value, the EU added value uh, isn't understood at all. So these are people absolutely against. It's an old, it's an old story. You can't change it. You didn't change it during the last but 50 years. No, it, if you allow me in this situation, you have much more anti-European feelings because nationally, Prime Ministers, Finance Ministers are saying we are paying to the European Union. And they uh, develop the idea, which is totally wrong, that they're paying to some bureaucrats that are getting the money of the taxpayers, which is not true at all. 94% of the money go back to the member states and they're managed by the member states. And they come with an additional leverage, being co-financing from the national budgets, from uh, financial institutions, from private businesses, etc., etc. So you have an effect on that. Maybe not the whole budget is the most effective thing, but this is not a reason to say, no, no, this is the, the bureaucracy bread so we are going to cut that uh, in times of austerity. No, the European budget is doing for the member states, including for the wealthy member states, something that the national budgets cannot do. This is public investments. Mr. Uh, and, and, yep. and in Just this time, we, we are in a, a single market. An euro invested from the level of, uh, of the uh, EU budget in a corner of Europe 
is is uh, creating um, a benefit in, in another corner because there are companies that are working on that money in other countries so the, the net contributors cannot say that they are not getting money back because they are not getting money back directly through the European budget but they are getting money back through the benefits of the single market and all the projects developed all over uh, Europe. I, I saw a study from one euro invested in, in uh, Poland through the uh, European projects, 0 0.65 uh, cents are, are going to Germany. So this is the, the situation, yes, many, the real situation Many people right now. in the UK, even also in Denmark, you, you, it's the first country to say, let's keep the money, we'll, we'll just spend it on our own, not bring it to Brussels and back, back yeah. at home. Well, look, uh, firstly, it's a very low okay. level of understanding of how the money is raised, who pays what, who gets what back. That doesn't help. Secondly, people right across Europe look at the European Union today and say, right, well, we pay into this, and what are we getting back? 25 million unemployed, horrendous levels of youth unemployment and stagnant growth. So many people are beginning to see Europe as the cause of their problems rather than offering the solutions. Now, uh, I think that's a tragedy because I think it can provide those solutions and one of the messages we want to say is look we have to change the way we operate we've got to start listening to those people and their concerns because if we don't we're in trouble we're yeah, in trouble but, but, but he he is right the big biggest problem right now in europe is jobs yeah to create job jobs you need investment investment means european budget european budget as was said is 95 percent um, uh, investment in the in the member states and this is not only European budget, because you, uh, ne uh, near European budget you need other money, which means, I don't know, to double or to, to triple the, the, the budget to uh, implement the projects. So this budget is to create jobs, is for the people. Well, some people say you would need a 20% budget of the, the whole European GDP to, to do something. But Mr. Ashford, coming back to why did David Cameron, Cameron push that way, saying, if we don't cut, there will just be tax raising, an increase of all people will have to pay for it. Where, where's the point? Well, I think the point was that he said the size of the budget needs to reflect the shape and size of the economies in the 27 member states. Firstly, uh, people are suffering austerity right throughout the European Union, and it would be somewhat perverse if the European Union budget was to be increased at that time. You'd, they wouldn't understand it. But secondly, actually the burden of cost on those member states a lot of them don't have that money to be able to contribute so yes we've got a smaller budget but it doesn't mean to say that we don't leverage that budget and invest it where it matters most now actually the new member states is where we get really good value for money I tell you what I come from a wealthy part of England you don't get good value for money and I, I stand by this statement investing in wealthy countries we should be investing in the new member states. We should be investing where we're going to create jobs and growth because those, that's going to drive the economy forwards. Is now the idea to wait for another three, four years and ask for more money afterwards? That's what Mr. Schulz said. Maybe we'll have a look later. It's not about uh, waiting and asking for, uh, for more. Uh, the fact is that uh, if we set a budget until 2020, neither at national level nor at European level, you don't have the certainty what's going to happen by 2020. I mean, uh, we see that uh, the f economic forecasts are extremely short term in these times and this is a matter of life, this is a fact of life, we cannot change it. So uh, how can we fix the priorities of, of a budget which is indeed a budget done in, in times of very, very harsh austerity in the member states <coughs> until 2020? At least we need to have the review in the middle of the period. Uh, you have the economic reasons for that. You have also the political reasons that Tom just mentioned. The next parliament and the next commission have to have a say uh, on the European budget. We cannot just uh, fix it and don't let them uh, do whatever. Okay. And a answer? Of course, we have the option also of saying it should only be a five-year budget. We can do that according to the treaty. Many of the cohesion countries are not very happy about that because they're afraid if you've got a shorter program period, it's difficult to, to program. Uh, of course, you don't need to have the, those two things together, but it is an option we could say if, if they don't want to make a midterm revision or we cannot get the right uh, guarantees for a midterm revision. There was a midterm revision in this programming period 
we didn't get it. So, so we need, really need to make certain that it's there, or we could take just a five-year period. Last question, because we're, we're running out of time. Uh, you'll have to come back, sit down again, tell something in June. Uh, does this mean today, okay, we'll, we'll just try to show you, you said at the beginning, Mr. Marinescu, we'll have to, it's not the problem in showing how strong it is, but somewhere it's, it's maybe this kind of fight starting. So don't you believe that within the next four months, elections are arriving next year, you will have such a pressure from the government's heads of states and government in your countries to say, you'll have to agree on what we decided and then it will be, again, I have to say, roll over and give up? I don't think so, because uh, what we are asking is to improve the decision of the of the European Council. So not for what we are asking through this uh, resolution uh, is to improve, not to delete something from the uh, European Council uh, decision. So uh, it's true that we are almost there. In the Council the, uh, conclusion is written maximum flexibility. We want very clear flexibility from year to year and from uh, uh, heading to heading. It's written that uh, it will be an amending budget, but we want to be very clear because they didn't do it uh, in, in this um, uh, MFF. So I think that um, uh, they will agree at the end to some of the points because we need a budget. We have to conclude the budget in order to conclude also all the horizontal um, uh, uh, policies in order to be able to be applied starting with 1st January 2014. Mr. Kelvin, very quickly. Okay, was that or not? I, I, I think that only now some heads of uh, government started realizing that uh, there is a European Parliament and it has a role in the whole process. We try to convince them since a long time. If they expect that with pressure they can change the situation, I'm afraid it's not going to work. In October we voted a similar resolution with 517 votes. Now after the Council conclusions, we voted with, uh, with 517, now with 506 votes. So the whole pressure uh, was uh, nonsense. The Parliament has a position, and this is not a stubbornness, this is a cross-party. We w just want to see a more efficient European budget. Efficient budget would be like this. And the answer? Exactly, <laughs> and uh, we want to make sure that it delivers on European policies. That's our point of view, where the heads of state had this very national point of view. That's a difference. So you are ready to say no in June if it's not the case? If it's not good enough, yes then uh, I'm ready to say no, it's not the end of the world because uh, we've got the framework of 2013. That's not wonderful. We'd like to see a solution, but it's not the end of the world if we don't get a solution. Richard, actually, it's not the end of the world. No, Last conclusion, this, <laughs> very quickly. Sorry. This is the way we do business here. Once every seven years you have this opportunity. Uh, we rarely come to an agreement right at the outset. We will leave it till the 11th hour. Both parties will stand toe to toe and see who flinches first, who gets most out of the deal. At the end of the day, there will be a deal. It will be a budget, which will be a good budget for Europe. Yeah. Okay. Don't forget that 2013 ceiling is bigger than what they are proposing right now. So they will accept our proposals in order not to have uh, more money in the budget. So in my opinion, it will be a deal. Okay, let's see in June, it's like this. Thanks a lot to all my guests. Thanks to you for watching. We'll meet again next month. Our topic in April will be the EU-US trade agreement, another big deal. Goodbye.